uh, we are happy to co-sponsor with the College of Global Public Health um, this current uh, Brown Bag Seminar. And uh, today I am happy to welcome um, you to Dr. Alexis Merjanos. Merjanos. Yeah. I can pronounce your first name. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I answer to that. Very good. So do I. I'll read to that as well. Uh, who's a clinical assistant professor uh, at the College of Global Public Health in Social and Behavioral Sciences uh, Department, one I'm also affiliated with. And she's the director of the research for the Population Impact Recovery and Resilience Research Program. Alexis is a public health sociologist, and she explores how population health is affected by exposure to environmental hazards, including hurricanes, floods, extreme heat and oil, extreme heat and oil spills. Um, she's particularly interested in how social inequalities um, shape the impact of environmental hazards on health, recovery, and resilience for vulnerable populations. Her current research is exploring erosion and flooding in high coastal communities um, and how that shapes decisions to age in place. So it's very relevant to our broader issue of aging. Today she's presenting on older adult long-term recovery and resilience following Hurricane Katrina. We thank you very much, Alexis, for sharing your information with us, and we look forward to hearing. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vicki. Um, thank you to the Aging Incubator for uh, hosting this brown bag, and thank you all for being here. It's nice to have some familiar faces, some friendly faces, um, and some newer faces. Um, so today I'm going to talk about older adult disaster recovery and resilience. And the title of the talk is a little different from what I initially proposed because as I was working through the story that I wanted to tell, um, I thought it was important also to, also to pull in our work from Hurricane Sandy. So I'll be talking about both of those disasters. Um, but because there are some newer people in the audience, is my clicker not going to work here? There we go. Okay. <laughs> All right, so because there are some newer people in the audience, I thought it would be good for me to take a little bit of time to explain who I am and the type of work that I do, um, because I think that the Aging Incubator offers a lot of opportunity to do uh, interdisciplinary work. So first and foremost, I'm trained as a sociologist. Um, that's my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, and I think that that's important because um, the work that I do is really centered around issues related to vulnerability and inequality. Um, a lot of the work that I do is focused on uh, issues related to housing and health, so looking at issues like housing instability, mobility, um, issues around housing tenure, so whether you own or you rent, and how it relates to mental health. Um, and obviously those issues are very closely tied to disaster recovery and resilience, which is an area that I've been working in for um, probably like about six or seven years and thinking about what are the factors that contribute to recovery? Um, what helps somebody recover from a traumatic event? And equally as important, what helps somebody bounce back from a traumatic event? What makes them resilient? And you can think that um, what we learn in disasters around resilience can easily be transferred to other areas um, where people experience traumatic events. And then more recently, um, I've been doing some work or some thinking around areas related to uh, aging in place, because I think this is a really um, interesting area. Uh, we have a lot of older adults who are aging in high-risk coastal regions, and thinking about not just only how do we prepare them for what will, what is to come, um, but also how does aging in place maybe contribute to existing health disparities? Aging in place is thought of as a choice, and I think that oftentimes it might even be a constrained choice. Um, I do qualitative and quantitative methods, so what I talk about today is really quantitative methods, quantitative analyses, uh, but I also teach the qualitative analysis class here at the college, um, and uh, I've done some uh, projects on in-depth interviewing. Um, and then lastly, I work, here's our team, <laughs> uh, more small but mighty, uh, program on population impact, recovery, and resilience. 
uh, where I'm director of research. Um, and the, the studies that I talk about today um, are data sets from this lab where uh, David Abramson is the director and also the PI of the studies. So I want to start with this statement. Older adults are vulnerable to disaster. How many of you either believe this to be true or maybe have read this somewhere? Just show of hands. Okay, so fair amount. Um, and you wouldn't really be wrong. So even if we go back through the last two years, we've seen a tremendous amount of, uh, of natural hazards occur. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this picture from Hurricane Harvey. This was a nursing home in Dickinson, Texas. Um, obviously, the floodwaters came in about waist high, and the owners of the facility tweeted this photo out to get help, and actually everybody was airlifted from this facility. And some of the uh, headlines around Harvey, geared around uh, older adults, we see elderly are among the most vulnerable during Harvey, <laughs> assisted living residents left in peril as Hurricane Harvey hits, and for elderly residents, hurricanes bring increased risks. We think about Hurricane Maria. Here's another headline. Life or death as Puerto Rico's older people go without essentials. We think for many months, older adults were without power. The entire island was, with, was without power. Um, and this meant lack of access to food, water, medical equipment. Puerto Rico deaths spike, but few are attributed to hurricane. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this terrible story about how initially it was about fewer than 100 deaths were attributed to Maria, and now they've adjusted that to more than 2,000. And then seniors in Puerto Rico face appalling conditions after Hurricane Maria. And you can see here this woman, this older woman, sitting on what's left of her couch and what's left of her apartment. And I think another uh, important issue to think about, especially in Puerto Rico, is we've also probably heard of the mass migration that's been happening there. And the people who are, again, I'll use air quotes around choosing, but the people who are choosing to stay um, are mainly older adults because they feel like this is their home. And the younger adults and those with children have actually come to the United States. So we have to think about also the longevity of, of this situation. And then Hurricane Irma, which was supposed to be this really powerful storm and thankfully was, was not, um, but we still had the single biggest death toll of 12 residents at a Florida nursing home. This was in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and what ended up happening was there were widespread power outages. This facility lost uh, air conditioning um, and 12 residents died either because they um, were overheated or dehydrated. Uh, the people that they rescued from here had an average body temperature of almost 110 degrees. And then Hurricane Michael. This photo, I mean, the, the storm was so incredibly powerful. It completely wiped out buildings and flattened communities um, as it came through the Panhandle region. And about a week after the storm, there were 27 deaths reported and over 1,100 people were, were reported missing or unaccounted for. And according to reports, most of the missing were either elderly, disabled, or lived alone. And then lastly, with the California wildfires, um, I'm kind of lumping these together because there have been so many over the last two years, but some of the headlines related to older adults California firestorm takes deadly toll on elderly. Average age of victims identified so far is 79. California says nursing homes abandoned elderly during fire. This is another really terrible story where uh, staff at two different nursing homes left and left all the residents to fend for themselves. Thankfully, nothing happened to them. Um, and why, why older people didn't fare well in Northern California wildfires? And the other thing that I have to bring your attention to is that um, the Forest Service has said that a third of American homes, so it's 44 million homes, live in this area called the Wildland Urban Interface, which means that they're at risk of burning from a wildfire. So 44 million homes, we have to think about who actually lives in those homes. So obviously, older adults 
are vulnerable to disaster. And this could be because of chronic illnesses, mobility problems, depleted social networks. Um, and we have a growing number of older adults who are living in these high-risk coastal areas that are prone to flooding, um, but also at risk for other environmental hazards. And even with this growing risk, we have a very little focus on the unique needs of the older adult population, um, especially when we're thinking long-term. So not just preparedness, but what does it mean to recover and how long does it take? So I wanted to return back to the statement. I'm just gonna keep bringing it up as we go throughout this talk. And I wanna pick it apart a little bit um, because older adults, we really have to think about what do we mean? What do we mean by older adults? Are we talking about 55 to 64 year olds who maybe we would be called the young old? The 65 to 74 year olds, the mid old? Or the over 75, the old old? Sometimes also we talk about older adults and we mean 65 and older. Or we're talking, really talking about the elderly, 75 and older. So I think it's really important that we start to distinguish, especially with an older population, population, what do we mean when we say older adults and when we're talking about disasters? And obviously older adults live in different types of places. They could live in assisted living facilities, nursing homes, they could be community dwelling adults, and all of those things contribute to their vulnerability. And then the second half of this is vulnerable to disaster. But we really have to think about how does vulnerability or disasters we know that there are four primary phases, right? And here they are. So we have mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And we can see that the mitigation and the preparedness, that's really before the event. And then we have preparedness and response, that's really the impact of the event. And then response and recovery after the event. So when we're talking about that older adults are vulnerable to disaster, well, which part are they vulnerable to? because they could be very vulnerable to the event itself, uh, and that could be preparedness, um, or they could be very vulnerable during response and recovery. So the reason why we have to think about these things is that we're putting so much money and effort into programming and making sure that these populations are cared for that we really need to be much more targeted in how we talk about it. So in order to explore this statement, I'm gonna be relying on two data sets from uh, IR squared. The first is the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study, or GCAP, which is a longitudinal cohort study from uh, Hurricane Katrina, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then we have the Sandy Child and Family Health Study, or SCAP, um, and I'm gonna start diving in here to SCAP. So this study was funded by the New Jersey Department of Health using social service block grant funds. It's a random sample of 1,000 residents who were living in or near the coastal areas that were most affected by uh, Hurricane Sandy. And the goal here was to describe and analyze the impacts and the long-term effects of Sandy on the residents um, living in the nine hardest hit counties in New Jersey. And to examine the factors that helped or hindered their recovery process, especially from their viewpoint. And what makes this, this cohort particularly powerful is the way that we sample, because oftentimes disaster cohorts can be convenient samples. Um, and instead here, uh, we took the nine New Jersey counties that were designated high impact. You can kind of hopefully see them outlined here. And we took three geographical layers, looking at storm surge greater than a foot, uh, the level of FEMA individual assistance claims, and also um, housing damage uh, in the census block that was greater than 30%. So greater than 30% of the houses in the census block had to be damaged. And we overlaid them, and that turned into what we call the disaster footprint. And this is the gray area that you see here. And in this gray area, that's where we sampled our 1,000 residents. And what makes SCAP really great for doing age-focused analyses is that 55% 50, of the cohort is over the age of 55. So we have 23% um, are the ages of 55 to 64, 19% are 65 to 74, and 13% are 75 and older. So I'm gonna talk about a paper that's forthcoming um, in the Journal of Gerontology, Social 
pieces uh, that our lab group worked on, and it's called Housing Transitions and Recovery of Older Adults Following Hurricane Sandy. And here we were looking at the social and environmental disruption on emergency housing transitions um, and self-reported recovery. And the reason why we um, thought this was a particularly interesting or unique take on older adult recovery was that because of how SCAP, the distribution of age in SCAP, we were able to look at differences between the young old, so 55 to 64, the mid old, 65 to 74, and the old old, 75 and older, and compare their experiences to younger adults. And so we looked at things like length of displacement, number of moves, uh, sorry, number of places stayed after Sandy, housing post, and uh, self-reported recovery. So the first graph I want to show you is displacement um, uh, by age group. And you can see down at the bottom, we have one to five weeks, six to 20 weeks, and 21 weeks or more. Um, and the one thing, the two things I want to bring your attention to is that you can see the younger age group had a higher percentage who were really displaced very short term. But if you look towards the right end of the graph, 21 weeks or more, we see higher rates of displacement among the 75 and older. Now if you look at number of places stayed by age, and, and you know the reason why uh, we thought that this was an important variable is that sometimes it's not about whether or not you've been displaced. But maybe if you've been displaced to many different places, that that's an additional stressor. So we looked at, you can see down here, zero, one, or two or more. Um, and zero means that you were not displaced. You didn't stay anywhere else besides your own home. And again, the two, the two areas to bring your attention to, we have these two younger age groups, the younger adults, and then the young old, that a majority of them were not displaced. But if we look at these older age groups, we see that they're, they were more likely to either be displaced to one or maybe two or more. And here we see that the oldest age group had the highest percentage of two or more places stayed. And then if we look at hosts following Hurricane Sandy, so you know this gets at that issue of social networks, social cohesion. You know, do you have somebody you can rely on? Um, so obviously those who were not displaced, they had no host because they're not staying with anyone else besides themselves. Um, and then we have multiple hosts. So did you stay with friends and family? Um, or did you stay with family only or friends only? And again, I wanna draw your attention to the right side of the graph where you can see that the two oldest age groups were more likely to stay with family. And I think that, yes, we would say, oh, well, of course older people would stay with their family. But to me, what this brings up is, what if older adults, adults don't have family close to them? Where are they going to go? Are they maybe instead not going to go anywhere because they don't have a reliable place to go, which then puts them at risk during an event. And then looking at housing damage. So again, we can see uh, here we have uh, no damage minor or affected, which actually is quite a bit of damage. It means you had to be out of your house for at least 30 days, um, or major damage slash destroyed. Um, and similarly, you can see these, like the, the younger age groups kind of have very similar rates of, of housing damage. But if we look at the older adults, 41% of those 75 and older um, had major damage or destroyed homes. So this kind of paints a picture of, um, of exposure, right? And, and we're kind of getting a sense that maybe older adults were more likely to experience high rates of, of exposure to Sandy, which may make you think, well, they're probably less likely to be recovered. But if we look at self-reported recovery, and this we dichotomize <laughs> into better slash the same, so are you better or the same since Sandy hit? Um, or are you worse or unsure about your status? Um, we can see that 76% of older adults said that they are better or the same. Now you might expect this to be lower than the other age groups, but this is not, not the case. So these descriptive results kind of gave us pause to, to further investigate and look at some uh, regressions. So looking at the housing transitions, 
The middle were 88% more likely to stay in one place besides their homes compared to younger adults. The old old were nearly two times more likely to stay in one place besides their home. The young old were 67% less likely to stay in two places besides their home. And then we have other significant variables like housing damage, housing tenure, so whether you're an owner or a renter, mental health, and region that were also significant. And then we looked at type of host. So older age was significantly associated with staying with family relative to staying alone, again, in comparison to younger adults. The mid-old were 81% more likely to stay with family compared to younger adults. And the old old were more than two times as likely to stay with family compared to the younger adults. And other significant predictors of who you stayed with including, included housing damage, housing tenure, region, and social support. <coughs> now looking at self-reported recovery. Age, number of places stayed, housing damage, social support, mental health, physical health, housing tenure, and education were all significant of self-reported recovery. The old old were 2.2 times as likely to report that they had recovered compared to younger adults, and yet age was not a significant predictor of recovery for the young old or the mid old. So I think that, you know, thinking about that statement again, older adults are vulnerable to disaster, I think this really plays up the point that I was trying to make that we need to talk, we need to really think about what do we mean by older adult? And how are we categorizing them to understand their experiences? Um, and in addition, it's very possible that the older adults, especially in this case in New Jersey, where most of them were living down by the shore, our older adults were mostly retired and in shore houses, um, so they're gonna have higher rates of exposure. Um, but even despite that, that they were more likely to say that they had recovered. Um, so the findings suggest that the old old were more resilient to Hurricane Sandy than younger age groups. Again, just to summarize, um, among all the age groups, the old old reported the highest rates of housing damage. They were more likely to stay in one place besides their home, and they were more likely to stay with family rather than by themselves. And despite this disruption, the old old were most likely to have recovered from Hurricane Sandy. And so these, these findings may help us think a little bit differently about the unique disaster, post-disaster needs and really around housing that older adults have. And this can help us identify points of intervention so we can offer effective programming. So that was cross-sectional data, and that's great. But really, we need to think long-term. And so that's where the Gulf Coast Child and Family Health Study comes in, or GCAP. And just a little bit of background. I know there have been a lot of these, so they all seem the same sometimes. Um, but you know, this was this was a very traumatic event. It's still uh, Hurricane Katrina is still uh, has the greatest level of devastation and destruction among all of the uh, storms in U.S. history. It displaced 1.5 million residents across the Gulf Coast. Um, which was the largest displacement since the 1930s Dust Bowl migration. And we had residents who went as far away to states as Colorado, Missouri, um, Georgia, South Carolina, et cetera. Um, and you know, I think that's really important, especially in this area where so many people have been in the Gulf Coast for generations and to have that uprooted, to be uprooted from that uh, and placed in, in, a, in an unfamiliar state can be um, very destructive. So just to talk a little bit about GCAP, um, these are some of the field team members from early on, uh, one of the first, or one, second wave, I think? Yes, first wave. First wave, okay. Um, so this was funded by the Children's Health Fund. Um, and GCAP has um, 1,079 individuals from 2006 to 2009. Um, and from 2017 to 2018 is our latest wave of data collection. So that's five waves of data. The residents were all from Louisiana and Mississippi and nearly all of them were displaced. Um, and what makes this study really powerful is that oftentimes disaster research is cross-sectional. 
and it focuses on the immediate aftermath of the event. But with these data, we can actually see what long-term recovery looks like. And then I put this up here for our team because this is a very prideful moment. Eighty-one percent um, of the of eligible respondents were retained for Wave Five, which is really incredible thinking about the displacement um, and exposure that these residents had. So very similar to what we talked about with Hurricane Sandy, but there are these common contributors to self-reported recovery that we look at. And that includes housing stability. So do you think that you live in a place that you can stay for a year or more? And that's what we consider to be permanent and stable. Good mental health, good physical health, social support, and household income. So I'm gonna go through each of these in relation to self-reported recovery. Um, but I wanna start first with housing stability because it was so critical and we find it to be so critical. Um, after many of the storms that, that we look at. And the reason why also for Hurricane Katrina in particular that this is such an important issue is that disaster survivors tend to be displaced to areas that are really close to their homes. And oftentimes this is just for a few days or a few weeks. Um, but Katrina was really different because people were displaced, like I said, to states as far away as Colorado. Um, and oftentimes this was months and some people haven't returned. Um, and unstable housing can delay recovery and also undermine various forms of resilience. So it's important to think about how much time passes before affected residents are able to find stable housing. And in order to do this, we applied methods from survival analysis to examine the relationship between time to stable housing and certain explanatory variables. I'm just going to focus on age today, but we looked at this with various uh, variables. So here you can see down at the bottom we have time to stable housing. This is number of days, which ranges from 0 to 1,750 days. Uh, the median number of days for the GCAP cohort to find stable housing was 1,082 days. That's almost three years. And then if we look at it by age, um, you can see uh, this first line here is going to be the older adults, 66 and older. The small dotted line is going to be 50 to 65. And then this next dotted line is 35 to 49, and then the solid line is the younger adults. And this may follow what you would think, right? Older adults, 66 and older, it didn't take them as long to find stable housing. 838 days, but that's still almost two years, very long time. Um, the 50 to 65 year olds, 1,021 days. Uh, the 35 to 49 year olds, 1,143 days. And then the youngest adults who tend to move around quite a bit anyway as they're younger, 1,355 days. Um, the reason why, even though this follows maybe what we, we would expect, again, thinking about that older adults are vulnerable to disaster, and yet they're the ones to find housing the fastest. Um, and that could be for a variety of reasons. It could be uh, due to uh, resources, uh, social support. It could be um, due to just a desire to find a place and stay and be settled. Um, but again, just interesting to think about these results within that context. So now let's move into the, uh, the longitudinal data, kind of looking at those constructs that I mentioned before um, and how they vary by age. Now you can see here, um, we have income as a categorical variable, and you can see that this is a highly impoverished sample. Uh, we have one, one category, tw 10 to $20,000 a year household income, annual household income, and 20 to 35,000 uh, annual household income. And what I wanna point out here is, if we look at the 65 and older, that they have a very stable household income as opposed to the other age groups where we see a lot of fluctuation. And that's important because we know that spikes in income, whether it's an increase or decrease, just the instability of it, can contribute to poor mental health. And so even though this is a, a, a pretty low bar here, that this, this fixed financial income may bring some sense of stability 
And then looking at mental health. So this uses the MCS, or the Mental Health Composite Score, which is part of the SF-12. Um, and the cutoff is 42. So if you're below 42, uh, you're considered to be in poor mental health. And you can see at the beginning with wave one, um, the two youngest age groups were below that 42 cut point. And the two older age groups were slightly above. Um, and as we get to wave five, you know, we kind of see the similar patterns, but all of the age groups have increased. Um, but again, the older adults, best mental health out of all the age groups. And then physical health, I don't think anything too surprising here. As you get older, your physical health gets way worse. Um, but actually what I want to point out here, even though you know I was really looking at these, the, the older adults, if you consider the younger adults, and so by wave five, they're you know in their mid to late forties, they're getting close to that forty-five cutoff, um, which is really disturbing, um, but maybe also not terribly surprising considering that a lot of them live in the Gulf Coast region, which is known to be not terribly healthy, um, but still something to think about. <coughs> and then social support, so. As of right now, um, we're still trying to harmonize the social support scale from wave five with our wave four measure. But I just wanted to show this to you to, to demonstrate how much social support fluctuates after a disaster. And this is really perceived social support. So do you think you have somebody that you can count on? Um, and this has proven to be a very powerful predictor of recovery. Um, and yet here we see that it really fluctuates. And although even saying that um, this is the 36 to 54 year olds relatively steady and the 55 to 64 year olds relatively steady. And then housing stability. So obviously this should reflect what we saw in the um, survival analysis. But again, looking at whether or not you live in stable housing, again, this follows the age groups, but the older adults most likely to be in stable housing from the get go and that just steady increase. But this is good news. 95% of our sample is in permanent and stable housing currently, which we actually were really pleasantly surprised by. Um, and then let's consider all of those factors that we just talked about and then say, well, shouldn't those really reflect self-reported recovery? And yet we don't see a terrible amount of variation here in self-reported recovery. One thing to, to take note of is that the older adults, the so 65 and older, you can see that they have this steady increase as opposed to the other age groups where you see maybe some crisscrossing, some fluctuation, but really a steady increase in their self-reported recovery. So now that we have these results, you know, what we really want to do is think about well, how did each of these factors contribute to self-reported recovery by age group? Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but we just closed data collection two weeks ago. So this is just going to be a taste. It's not going to be, you know, what we really want to do. But this is just using wave four. And what we have here are um, a path analysis looking at the significant indirect and direct effects of those contributors that we were previously talking about on self-reported recovery by age. So for the 18 to 35 year olds, you can see that there's a direct effect from housing, income, mental health, and social support. And that we also have indirect effects of mental health on housing um, to recovery through housing, and mental health to recovery through social support. The only thing that's not uh, significant is physical health. Now if we look at the 36 to 54 year olds, we again see this direct significant effect from mental health to recovery and also housing to recovery and then indirect effects of income and mental health through housing on self-reported recovery. And all of these effects are, you know, small to mid-size effects. Now you're ready for the exciting part? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. This is the 55 to 64 year olds and none of these factors that we think contribute to self-reported recovery have a significant direct or indirect effect on, on self-reported recovery. And the reason why this stands out to me is actually in relation to the SCAP paper. 
because this in the SCAP paper, um, this age group, actually came across as the group that needed the most support. And you can think that this is pretty much the sandwich generation. These are gonna be adults that may have older children, maybe in college, um, and they may have a responsibility to an aging parent or a relative. Um, and they may also be thinking about when can I stop working, right? It should be on the horizon. And instead you go through this very traumatic event um, and it disrupts everything that you've worked towards. Um, and so again, this goes back to this older adult disaster vulnerability, but you know, maybe it's not, especially post disaster during the recovery phase, it might not be the 65 year olds and older or the 75 and older. It may be this group that needs the greatest amount of support and intervention. And then here we see the 65 and older, that they have this very strong uh, direct effect between mental health and self-reported recovery, and a direct effect of stable housing with self-reported recovery, and then also this indirect effect of income through housing on recovery. And I think the other interesting thing to note is that, you know, here we have all of these things matter to you when you're younger. And as you get older, all you need is good mental health. <laughs> so um, what are some of the implications of, of this work? So obviously, you know, 80%, it's maybe going to be an estimated 80% increase in the older adult population over the next 20 years. And I like to argue, this sounds dramatic, but I really think that it's true, that we're on this collision course between the natural environment and the built environment. And then when you think of the silver tsunami that's coming, it's right at that intersection. <coughs> and so the vulnerability of this aging population to future environmental hazards, it's going to increase only as sea levels are rising, as we have stronger natural hazards that occur. And we also have a greater number of people living in coastal regions. Um, these coastal regions are getting denser. Um, we're building a lot of buildings. It's very similar to what we saw with Harvey when you uh, take out any kind of green space that um, could help with flooding, that you increase risk. So now we're at this point where rather than just saying older adults are vulnerable to disaster, that we really need to consider who among older adults are most vulnerable and when are they most vulnerable. And this could be community dwelling, living alone, mobility issues, caregivers, retirement homes, right? They, these results just focus on community dwelling older adults. So the next steps for us um, are going to turn those path analyses into longitudinal path analyses so we can see over time how those, um, how those contributors impact self-reported recovery. And I wanna leave with this picture um, because I find it to be it's so powerful. Um, this is uh, Mexico Beach after uh, Hurricane Michael. This is the lone standing structure. It's called the Sand Palace, it has a name. Um, and it was built um, by its owners to withstand 250 mile per hour winds. Um, they did that by choice. It obviously increased the cost of the home. Um, but you know, when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992, Florida instituted a policy that uh, any new structures in South Florida had to be built to withstand 150 to 170 mile per hour winds. But in the panhandle where the storm hit, the structures only had to be built to withstand 120 mile per hour winds. So this was a choice. But I think that if we need, if we want to keep living in these areas, that we need to build smarter and we need to build better because it's going to decrease our vulnerability um, and it's really hard to convince people to leave these areas until something like this happens. So I would like to thank Higher Square team, David, Rachel, Sarah, and Yunsu, and thank you guys and I'm happy to take any questions.
loss of functional ability or in health events better than adults who are either middle-aged or on the younger age. And the best predictor of it is a sense of a will to live. Mm. So uh, I think what you're kind of showing here is that spirit that comes with advanced age that mm -hmm. we will be. Yeah. So I, very consistent. I, I completely agree and I, I think that, you know, these findings aren't, I, I don't think that they're necessarily surprising to uh, aging researchers, but I can tell you that in the disaster field that there's a lot of variability about how older adults fare following, mm -hmm. a, following a disaster. Um, and part of that is because we just don't have the longitudinal data. But these results make sense, especially within that context. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, it's like, how do we harness that? We always talk about building resilience among the people who are exposed to these traumatic events. Is this on? Um, but um, it's like, how do we harness that to um, help other people build resilience? Because essentially what we're talking about is time. As time passes, you build some sort of resilience because you've experienced things. Um, Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's a great point. Thank you. Did you focus um, on mobility impairment? Well, just we, I just want to say that I represent the citizens at Smith Housing, host Sandy. Mm -hmm. The <coughs> problem is that New York City fire drills only apply to commercial buildings and not to residential buildings. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with the fire department. There's a major problem in terms of getting those people out into safe places. Mm -hmm. And I think this, the effects of disasters affect people with health and mobility. Absolutely. A lot more. But, but it seems like there hasn't been enough government response for, for better response. Yeah, there definitely, um, you know, this gets that issue of prep, preparation and response. Um, somebody's going through their papers or something. <laughs> Um, it gets this issue of preparedness and response, and again, I think that that's where <coughs> older adults are most vulnerable. Um, and, and especially in an urban area, how do we get, and I know that there are nursing homes, especially in the city, being built to 25 stories. How are you supposed to properly evacuate, especially without proper preparation, evacuate 25 stories of, of a nursing home during a, a, a disaster? Um, and you know, I think that this happened in the Far Rockaways um, during Sandy. Um, but yeah, this is an issue of preparedness. I think. I was wondering, you know, thinking about aging, I wonder if it would be interesting not just to look at these differences, the impact and recovery by age, but also the impact of the disaster on the aging process. Mm. And you have that nice longitudinal data, so mm. thinking about like healthy aging yes. and how disasters can come and sort of just throw that off track. Yeah, absolutely. Especially talking about these issues of mobility, and I was working at the health department during Sandy, and they were evacuating nursing homes in Coney Island, and there was like a big garbage bag of meds, and no one knew who they were for, and the records were flooded. No, no one had diabetes in the room. So these ideas that health can really suffer, like man, chronic diseases can suffer, and then it has a longer trajectory. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I mean, we're. I think that part of what we want to do with with the Katrina data is, is look at, you know, how did this affect people's physical health? Yeah. And a component of that is certainly healthy aging. Um, you know, did people die sooner than they should have? Um, and do we have, you know, for us thinking about what is that comparison group? Because we need to have somebody who, a group that wasn't exposed, right. Right, in order to kind of think about uh, how it disrupted yeah. aging. I was thinking about that and thinking maybe general, just comparison with the general population. If you can get something geographically similar, but I was thinking the same problem. Yeah. You could start with just life expectancy, perhaps, mm -hmm. and go from there, because yeah. that data is pretty available. Pretty low in that area. Great. Right. <laughs> but potentially even lower. Yeah. After. 
that are brave in coming in to maybe people who experience natural disasters beforehand. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about how um, disasters affect migration. Mm -hmm. So even with uh, the family, right? So maybe especially in here in New York City, we have a lot of immigrant population, people who have been displaced by the earthquakes in Haiti. Um, so just how do you know if um, these numbers include immigrants? Mm -hmm. And how that impacts your life? Yeah, so um, I would say this is something that we've recently considered in probably the last three years was the second wave of our Sandy data collection where we started asking, we started hearing a lot about um, Irene, Hurricane Irene, mm -hmm. um, and how that affected people's willingness to evacuate or, or whether they took the messaging seriously. And so then we started adding in, you know, did you, were you exposed to Hurricane Irene? And almost everybody was, and, and you can see that, especially for the people living in the South, that had a huge impact on how they um, experienced Sandy. And then with Katrina, that population down the Gulf Coast has, has experienced countless disasters. And so now with the fifth wave of data, we actually have quite a substantial list of all the possible disasters that they've experienced, but it's all local. I don't think that we're really picking up on uh, maybe immigrant populations, um, what they've experienced outside of the United States. And also thinking as well with Harvey and how it impacted Texas and Florida, those are the high populations of foreign born uh, people. Yeah. Yeah, and we also had people from our cohort end up in Houston and then live through Harvey after they had been exposed to Katrina. Yeah. Um, thank you. You touched on um, increasing the resilience through infrastructure. Let's get some more data on that in terms of Mexico. Do you have any ideas on interventions you need to increase the resilience amongst the 55 and the 60 40? Yeah, so. That's really tied to, to built environment uh, resilience for that particular age group. Mm -hmm. Because what I think a lot of them might need um, is awareness. And we heard a lot after Hurricane Sandy in New Jersey mm -hmm. that they had a ton of programs that people didn't access. Mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of money was left on the table. And they were kind of like, well, why? What's going on? Why are we not telling people? And I think a lot for this particular age group, you know, there's a sense of pride there. It's like you've worked your whole life. You probably, at least in terms of Sandy, um, this was a middle class state. And so a lot of people had savings. They were putting their kids through college um, and they had to tap all of that. And so they weren't used to asking for help. Um, so I think that maybe bringing that acceptance to the programs that you know, at least with this population in Sandy, that it's, it's not a handout, it's, it's recovery. Um, and framing it differently might be helpful. Um, but you know, in terms of, I think, when we're thinking about built infrastructure, that we really have to think about what are the standards, what are the policies that we're putting in place? Uh, just that simple change that Florida decided to put that restriction, those building codes in South Florida, but not in Panhandle, thinking that that's never gonna happen there. We can't think that way anymore. It can happen anywhere, at any time. And so having these various codes, um, I think we have to up the standards. The people that built that house, they, in the article, they believe in climate change, they believe in sea level rise, and they wanted that home to be in their family for generations. And so that's why they built it that way. But now there's no community surrounding it. I'm also concerned about the displacement when they rebuild. A lot of times you should take into account displacement to the poor. Mm -hmm. And even New York City is building and promoting weatherproof buildings, but it's actually displacing people. Absolutely. So I think it's important to look at that. But also homeowners versus renters. Mm -hmm. That's a big probably analysis that people want to add is race and class. Mm -hmm. to, uh... Yeah, so, um, you know, I've, I've done a project looking at um, the differences between owners and renters after Hurricane Katrina and, and um, the effects of displacement on their mental health. And the renters fared worse. Um, and that was because in New Orleans, a lot of the lower income renters were pushed out. And this is what Naomi Klein calls disaster capitalism. As a place gets wiped out, it's an opportunity to build better for 
wealthier populations and to attract the type of population that you think in your that cities think will bring uh, higher amounts of income and jobs, etc. And it pushes out people who have been there forever, and that's their homes. And so, absolutely, that has a tremendous effect on their mental health. Well. Wow.